comfy. Yeah. Okay. Well, Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I know everyone here is really excited to hear from you. I want us to just dive right in and talk about something that you've identified as a cornerstone of Salesforce's culture, and it's a huge part of the business philosophy. Um, and it's this sort of idea of one, one, one philanthropy. Um, and so for those who aren't familiar, maybe you can kind of walk us through what that is and sort of sure. why it's so important to the culture of, of what you do. Well, when we started Salesforce um, 17 years ago, we decided to take on basically three ideas. One was uh, a radically new technology model, uh, the concept that we would, could use multi-tenancy and metadata platforms to recreate how we built and deployed enterprise software today. We call that the cloud. Two, um, a radically different business model, uh, a business model built on a subscription type service where customer service and customer success would be tightly aligned with us as the vendor. And three, that we would take 1% of our equity, 1% of all of our profit, 1% of all of our product, and put it into a 501c3 public charity uh, called Salesforce Foundation. It was very easy at the time because we had no people, we had no product, yeah. we had no equity. <laughs> you know, but today we're a company that's worth you know, between 40 and $50 billion. We have 20,000 employees. We'll do over $8 billion in revenue this year. So we've been able to give back uh, more than um, 1.3 million hours of community service. Wow. Uh, we will um, deliver our service for free this year to 25,000 nonprofits and NGOs, or deliver about $250 million in services to that sector for free. And we've given away more than $100 million in grants. And volunteerism has very just becomes a very core part of who we are and kind of our pursuit in our in, in the fight for. Uh, uh, equality. Mm -hmm. And how, how do you decide or how does the company decide internally where to dedicate those pretty sizable resources? I mean that's not a small amount of time, money or energy. So how, and especially being based in a city like San Francisco, which is going through so many changes and has sort of, th there is so much that could be done there. So how are you deciding what to focus on and how has that changed? Well there's really, Francisco. really two two focuses. One is more of what I almost call tactical focus, which is really driven by the employees. Mm -hmm. So employees also get employee grants. Of course, employees are deciding where to do their volunteerism. We just upped it so that employees get seven days a year paid time off in addition to their vacation, but dedicated for volunteerism. A lot of those employees will bulk it together. They'll go on trips together. They'll go do They'll, they'll meet one of these NGOs, be inspired, and go do work with them somewhere. Mm -hmm. So we just had a couple dozen employees go to Sri Lanka to work with John Wood at Room to Read and put computers in schools for a week. That's a huge um, and exciting effort. We've seen them do that in other parts of the world, like Cambodia as well. And uh, that's just you know, a, a huge cultural shift for them that they are they meet each other, sometimes for the first time. They're spending this... A huge amount of time, you know, out of work. Uh, obviously, the, the benefits back to Salesforce, I think, are unbelievable, mm -hmm. but also we're doing all this great work in the world as well. Um, and so that's tactically being driven by them. They choose where they're going, what they're going to put their work into, where those, and a lot of smaller gifts are dedicated in that area. Then there's the strategic side, which is more than half our workforce is in San Francisco. So we're very focused on. Um, of course, the public hospitals, um, of course, the homeless, but we're also very focused on uh, public schools. And we've, we're in the double-digit millions on grants right now on the K-12 through system. Mm -hmm. And we're really focused on how do we improve the public schools in San Francisco. We've not only personally adopted a number of public schools, I've personally adopted a public school, but also the employees are inside doing volunteerism in the public schools. We've also... Um, done significant uh, uh, technology development uh, that, that kind of provides a platform that lets us give more money and also gives a, allows us to give uh, time to the public schools. Mm -hmm. For three years in a row, we've also done what we call innovation grants in the public schools, so the, to principals of our top 12 middle schools, and I think it's expanded beyond that, maybe it's our top, include, and now it includes our K through uh, eight schools receive a $100,000 innovation grant each from us every year to do whatever they want to do in their school. Could be a capital improvement, 
could be a technology improvement, could be a human resource improvement. Um, some of them have done really well, some of them haven't done really well, but the big thing that they have to do is they have to come and you know, talk to each other and explain how they use the money, and from that they've learned from each other, and then those have uh, advanced into some very material advances into the school system. Mm -hmm. Where does that interest come from? Do you have a background in philanthropy, or does someone in your family work in that? Or? No, mm -hmm. I don't have a background in philanthropy. Mm -hmm. I'm a software person. I've been mm -hmm. writing software since I was 14 years old. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? Ha where a lot of it came from was I worked before. I, I've been doing Salesforce now for 17 years, right. and before that, I worked at Oracle for 13 years, mm -hmm. and. Um, after working at Oracle for about 10 years, which was kind of the drive to about, you know, Oracle zero to kind of six or seven billion in revenue, it just felt very empty. It just did not have a lot of uh, uh, good feelings associated with it. And as I was kind of going into the office every day, I felt that there was a part of myself that was not being fulfilled. And I was then kind of looking, how do I find a way to fill that part of myself that work is not filling. And so I'm like, oh, well, should I be doing more volunteerism and I'm trying to do that? Or should I be doing more spiritual development? Should I be doing more travel? And finally, I didn't get those answers. And so then in May of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 1996, after being at Oracle for 10 years, I went into my boss's office and I said, you know, this is, you know, uh, uh, I'm at a kind of a crossroads and I want to take some time off. Mm -hmm. And he uh, uh, was very supportive and said, great. And I, so I took 90 days. And um, I went off and really thought about, okay, what do I want to do and what's going on? And I came back and it still was not that clear, but it was clearer. And I started a new project at Oracle. I was building new products. I was working with customers. And then what happened was, is I got a call um, from a friend of mine who said, oh, well, I'm going to go to India. Do you want to go to India with me? So I took a left turn, and I went, to, went back into his office. So it's pretty nice, actually, at this point. And I said, I know I just took off some time. I want to take off a little bit more time. And he knew <laughs> that if, you know, he was, he was really trying to keep me in the company, which was the right thing to do. And he's like, hey, you know, go and do what you need to do. And so I went to India. Um, I met a lot of really amazing people. I had a really powerful experience. And one of my most powerful experiences happened in the backwaters. Have you been to India? Not yet. Anyway, India is, this is kind of very abstracted, but India is kind of like the north and the south. Mm -hmm. It's not an, a great uh, description because it's a huge and important country, but the south of India is kind of a matriarchy. And the gurus in the north is, is more of a, in the north is more of a patriarchy. And the gurus in the north tend to be more men. And the gurus in the south tend to be more women. And I'm kind of, you know, going to meet a guru in um, Trivandrum uh, near Kovalam Beach in, the, um, in Kerala, which is kind of in the backwaters of the Arabian Sea. Mm -hmm. And I'm with a friend of mine, Arjun Gupta, who's starting this new venture capital company called mm -hmm. Telesoft Partners. And he had been born in New Delhi, but he had never traveled through India before. So we're kind of going together. We're heading uh, uh, to the ashram uh, to see this guru. And we go in, and um, um, we're there. And, and um, she's like, oh, we'll come in the, in the back room. And it could be, at this point, kind of a scene in a movie where there's incense kind of wafting by, and there's music, <laughs> and, yeah. you know, the whole... Anything can happen. <laughs> Anything can happen, and we're sitting there with her for about an hour and talking to her, and kind of Arjun um, goes into kind of sales mode. He's got his Telesoft business plan, and he's very excited, and he's telling her about all the changes that are coming, you know, in the cloud and social networks and mobility, you know, and how data science, analytics, artificial intelligence, deep learning, all these things are going to happen, and why he needs to create this fund to kind of make all these things uh, happen, and we're having this great experience with her, and I'm just sitting there and going, wow, this is, you know, pretty wild, and, you know, we're, and uh, she's enjoying it, and, um, and then at the end, um, she just turns to him, mm -hmm. and she says, Arjun, this is so wonderful, congratulations, this is such an exciting vision for the future of the technology industry, but while you work on your career, and while you do all this work, and while you work to make the technology industry better and bigger and more successful, don't forget about doing something for others. Mm. 
Don't forget to actually improve the world as well. And that was a big shift. That was a change where all of a sudden I could see him go, whoa, you know, I don't know what she's saying. But when she said that, <laughs> she said that to him and I was like, I'm gonna file that one away, yeah. okay? Yeah. <laughs> and it was funny, cause I got, a, I, I, I got back to Oracle, I'm at my desk, you know, um, um, and uh, I'm sitting there and the uh, phone rang and um, um, it was somebody who I met on my trip uh, who was putting on this uh, seminar called the President Summit for America's Future mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. It was gonna be the five living presidents were gonna come together and put together this program, okay, uh, with all the top 500 CEOs mm -hmm. in the country. And I'm like, I can't miss, this is a great opportunity. I gotta go do this. So I got on a plane and went to Philadelphia and I got in there and then someone who's become a huge mentor to me now, and but I had never met, and is actually now on our board of directors at Salesforce, mm -hmm. General Colin Powell, was kind of at the top of the, 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 uh, the program, and they're on stage, and the 500 CEOs are sitting there, and I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And all of a sudden he says, you know, captains of industry, Fortune 500 CEOs, you know, we're here with the five living presidents of the United States, and Nancy Reagan was representing Ronald Reagan at that point, and he said, I just, we came here to just tell you one thing. In your pursuit of being a great corporation and you know, earning shareholder return and maximizing your, 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 the return for your investors, don't forget about doing other, something for other people. Mm -hmm. And don't forget to try to make the world better. And it was as if right at that moment, I was back in India and I was thinking, wow, that's exactly what that woman just said to Arjun. And I'm like, this is the same exact thing. This is amazing. And so I'm like, okay, I think I'm getting, the starting to get yeah. the idea that there's this kind of general call that maybe there's an opportunity that business can be a platform for change. Mm -hmm. Business itself, okay, can be this greatest opportunity to make the world better. And that at that point, what General Colin Powell was saying was, go into the Boys and Girls Clubs, go into the YMCA's, mm -hmm. go into the public schools send your employees in, really try to integrate, mm. integrate your business with the world. This would be a powerful opportunity. Mm. And so cool. that's where I was like, okay, let's, let's do this and let's see what we can do. And so what was unique, I think, for us, instead of just saying, yes, yeah, Salesforce is gonna have some of that and whatever, in my mind, I started thinking, okay, is there a model? In the way that I have a technology model, in the way that I have a business model, is there a model, philanthropic model, okay, a social good model, where I could integrate the culture? Mm -hmm. Because obviously, with 20,000 employees at Salesforce, I can't you know, be out there evangelizing it to everybody. I need something that's deep inside our culture from day one that will scale and integrate our company mm -hmm. with the social good. How do we do that from the yeah. beginning? Well, what's interesting to me about that anecdote is that in our Future of Work issue that came out last Sunday, the piece that I worked on actually you know, looked at a survey of millennials and the thing that they prioritize the most is feeling good about the work that they do. And so what you're saying completely resonates with sort of this, this recent survey. And I'm curious to hear if, does this internal policy help with retention, help with recruitment? Does it come up as a thing that younger workers, which you know, we know that that's a big part of the, you know, the turnover and the engine of the valley, does that work to kind of bring in fresh blood to Salesforce? Well, at Salesforce, our attrition rates are actually quite low. And um, uh, I do think that I would agree with you that millennials want meaning in their work. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, when I was at Oracle, you know, I was working for a great entrepreneur, Larry Ellison. I was getting tremendous mentorship from him. I had, you know, we had these products. But I kept saying to myself over and over again, is this all Oracle is? Mm. That we're just here to build and sell these products? And that was the kind of, that was my kind of real angst, okay? Where I was like, there has to be something more to what I'm doing. What is the purpose of Oracle? Is it just to make Larry Ellison money? And is it just to build these products, mm -hmm. you know, and control this part of the industry? And that's where I'm like, companies can do more. You can do more. You have all this capability as a CEO, you know, mm -hmm. you have these relationships, you have the technology, mm -hmm. you have all this money, you have all this capability as a CEO, what can you do with it besides just dominating an industry? Dominating an industry is not that hard. It's been done by thousands of people, you know, over a long period of time, you know, that yeah. it's kind of all set up, here's how to do it. But can you do something other than that? Could you also, 
you know, actually make the world a little bit better while you're also making, you know, your customer successful? Because if it's all about just making the customer successful, your employees, while they like the customers, are going to get that feeling, which is what millennials are responding to, which is that, hey, there's challenges in the world, and they want to be part of fixing it and making it better. They want to improve the state of the world, that the business of business is improving the state of the world. Right. You know, that's the kind of the Milton Friedman quote, the business of business is business. And I understand that, you know, philosophy. I learned that, you know, when I was at USC, which is like the pursuit, you know, of the dollar. That's great. But it's not mutually exclusive from the mutual pursuit of the common good. And if you can unite business to making it a force for good and a force for change, that's where you can make a difference. And you can see that with what we're going through right now in Georgia. You know, we are busy down in Georgia right now because you have state senators, okay, who are trying to pass a bill mm -hmm. who are, that is gonna allow them to discriminate pe against people in Georgia. So it, whether if you're, you know, LGBT, or if you're a different race, or whatever it is, or different, you know, different orientation than what they are representing, mm -hmm. you're gonna have laws on the books in Georgia that are gonna prevent you from basically having your freedoms. And our employees, you know, kind of look to me and say, well, you need to go fight for us in Georgia because we don't wanna be discriminated against. We went through exactly the same thing exactly one year ago in Indiana where we had a, mm -hmm. <laughs> Governor in Indiana, hey, you're out there, you know, saying you're making the world better, that signed a horrible law mm -hmm. that allowed Indiana to discriminate against our employees and our customers. And then the employees and the customers look to me and say, we've got to stop that. Now, that starting last week in Georgia, we have the same thing happening. House Bill 757, the New York Times um, editorial board wrote a brilliant piece on Friday on this bill which basically said, this is a highly discriminatory piece of legislation in Georgia, and yeah. it's gonna really impact people in a negative way, it's gonna impact the economy in a, in a negative way, and you have these senators in Georgia who are fighting us you know, on Twitter and all this, saying, this is great and we love it, and it's like, hey, it's not great for our employees, and if you put that bill in Georgia, you know, the first thing we did was, I went to Twitter and I have a little Twitter poll that I did uh, on Friday, which was, hey, if they pass this bill, do you want us to have our Connections Conference in Atlanta? So we're having this conference in May. It's 15,000 people. We have to bring our customers in and employees from all over the world. The big question is for them, hey, we, you can see what the laws are gonna be then in Georgia. Do you want that? Or do you want us to move the conference? 80% said move the conference. 20% 20, 20 said keep the conference where it is. Okay, so there's still people who are not going to support that, okay, 20%. But 80% are like, move that damn conference. And then I sent an email on Friday to about 25 or 30 of my friends who are all CEOs of, of global companies. And now we're seeing a wave of CEOs on Twitter coming out saying, we're going to do the same thing. So Richard Branson uh, tweeted over the weekend, Michael Dell tweeted over the weekend. Um, we uh, also saw a really aggressive tweet from Paul Pullman, who's the CEO of Unilever, mm -hmm. over the weekend. Brad Smith, who's the general counsel of Microsoft, tweeted over the weekend. So we just need to let those legislators know in Georgia, hey, you're gonna do that to our employees and our customers. There will be economic consequences. And there will be kind of a rolling thunder of economic sanctions against Georgia if they pass that bill. Wow. I mean, sign it. They've already passed it, actually, in the legislature. The governor, Governor Deal, has to sign it into law. I see. So, and then yesterday, he issued a statement, I will not sign this bill if it's discriminatory. So that's exciting for us mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we're paying attention and we have to advocate and say, hold on. And that's also what's great about some of the social media, that in two or three days, mm -hmm. you can take something, which was that train had left the station. And last year in Indiana, because we didn't have a lot of experience with this and we didn't really know what we were doing, we got there almost a little too late. We had written a couple of letters to the governor, mm -hmm. but we never thought the governor Pence would sign that law in Indiana a year ago, okay? Now we're at least ahead of it and saying, hey, Governor Deal, I don't know if you saw what happened with Governor uh, Pence 
and then we posted like the video of Governor Pence being interviewed by George Stephanopoulos, right. where George Stephanopoulos says, Governor Pence, tell us, yes or no, is this law discriminatory against the LGBT community? Wow. And he just would not answer that question because he knew what the answer was. It was yes, and that he was basically saying, I discriminate. And then he had to backtrack because all of a sudden, within one week, $50 million of conferences mm -hmm. and events in Indiana all were canceled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was incredible. Yeah, and then even amazing. the NCAA yeah. said they were going to withdraw. And so we're trying to create that same kind of momentum right now in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And there you can, companies that are based down there have already kind of gotten out there very aggressively. Home Depot, mm -hmm. Coca-Cola, you know, UPS, Delta Airlines. The reason that Dell got involved is they have a great company there called SecureWorks. They're all like saying, hey, you know, this is not good for business because we're not going to be able to hire people. We're not going to be able to bring customers in for programs. So Absolutely. Um, no, that's incredible. And I, I want to make sure, I have a million more questions for you, but I, I know that there are lots of questions here as well. And so I want to use our last couple minutes to take a couple audience questions, if there are any. I see one right there in the front. You, ma'am? If you wouldn't mind saying um, who you are and where you're from. Yes. Uh, Adam Grant and um, Amy Cuddy talked about uh, briefly about you know how women are unfortunately perceived differently in the workforce. And I first want to applaud Mark uh, for his incredible efforts to make sure that women in his workforce are treated fairly. And my, my question is, what can you share with your colleagues uh, positive experiences to let them know that, you know, particularly those who are hesitant to know that it is okay to have women have an equal playing field in the workforce? Well, I think this is another side of the same coin, which is, you know, when we talk about what's going on here with, um, when we talk about what's going on here with uh, Indiana and Georgia, okay, when the fight for equality for LGBT, okay, and for fight for racial equality, we are also at the same time fighting for the equality for women. So last Thursday, we had a dinner in Los Angeles at Patricia Arquette's house that I co-sponsored with Patricia Arquette. And we're sitting there at the table, and you know, our story is this, which is that um, you know, four or five years ago, we started to have meetings uh, at Salesforce, actually, in this very room. And I would look around this room, and a lot of the attendees were men, much higher percentage than I would have liked. So I created something called a women's surge, where we would basically look at who we're bringing to the meeting, and then we would always make sure that we'd have 30, 40%, 50% women in these meetings. We'd just surge high, high potential females in, and it started to work, where we would get more advancement opportunities for women, and we'd get, you know, we're hiring more women, and so forth. And it's a conscious effort to build more women into our um, uh, uh, executive ranks and into our company overall. Then, two of my uh, female executives, uh, Layla Seika and Cindy Robbins came to me and said, look, this is great, it's working, you know, the women's surge, fantastic program, but, you know, we pay women less than men here at Salesforce. I'm like, that's not possible. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, look at you two, you guys are very highly paid, it's highly paid. <laughs> and I mean, I know their salaries, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, you, I'm like, fine, go person by person and you make sure that every woman is paid exactly the same for a man in the same level of pay. Mm -hmm. So it turned out, yeah, we had $3 million of discrepancies and we made that adjustment, okay? Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and that's what CEOs have to commit to doing. They mm -hmm. have to commit. This is kind of the, you know, we're talking about things CEOs can do mm -hmm. to create a better company. They can fight for their, they can fight for their employees' rights, okay, in the public forum. They can also look and make sure that their employees are paid equally. So equal pay, this is a major issue. You saw the Equal Pay Act that mm -hmm. uh, President Obama signed into law when he mm -hmm. first became president, basically came off the back of Lily Ledbetter, who was this Goodyear employee, okay, who after spending her whole career at Goodyear, found out what her peer, male peer made during the same period, and it was significantly higher, went to the Supreme Court, and they basically said, no, we don't have to pay women and men the same. So this really comes out of the Constitution. I mean, we forget that women have not been voting 
in the United States during the entire history of you know, our country. It's mm -hmm. a relatively recent phenomenon. We still have a lot of laws on the books that kind of yeah. hold women down, that yeah. hold minorities down, that hold LGBT down. And when are we going to get rid of those laws and move these people up? And here we are in Georgia, we're adding another law. Yeah. And you know, that is an amazing part of the United States. We, of course, we're a country of laws, we're a country of freedom, we're a country of ideas, and yet we l lay in this legislation that represses people. Mm -hmm. So this is something that CEOs can do. They can step in, mm -hmm. okay, because they've got a lot of friends, and they have a lot of relationships, they have a lot of employees, and they can move okay. things up. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, I think, an important message in today's world, that you've got to fight for what's right and you have the power with, certainly with mobility, you know, like, I'm not doing this with a huge team, I'm just doing this on my own on Twitter. Absolutely. You know, it's like, yeah. I'm not gonna bother my people with this, it's not that hard to tweet, hey, check yeah. this out, you know, this guy is like trying to hold everyone back. Mm -hmm. And on that note, I mean, thank you so much okay. for sharing all those insights. We're unfortunately, we're out of time, thank but you. what a great note to end on. So thank thanks you so much. much.